Turn in your Bibles to Revelation 2. Revelation 2, verse 7. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Verse 11. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Verse 17. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Verse 26. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. Verse 27 to the end. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron as vessels of a potter. Shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. And I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Chapter 3, verse 5. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot his name out of the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Verse 12. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from God, and I will write upon him my new name. Revelation 21. Verse 6 and 7. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Back to Revelation 3. And verse 21, it says, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. God bless you for being here tonight. Good to see you. Phil, Ellen, good to see you. God bless us as we're together. You know, I was thinking, there are lots of different denominations. You know, you call, we call them whistlers and the sleeping preachers and Beaches and all kinds of names. I think I, I think we could come up with a new one. The stumbling preachers. <laughs> I don't know what I don't know what their strong point would be. I don't. You, you all don't. Some of you don't uh, know what I'm talking about. We had a little mishap here last evening. I was trying to demonstrate something here off the, off the step, and I ended up in that room on the floor. <laughs> so that's where that came from. An overcomer. Are you an overcomer?
The Bible says in, in, chapter, in verse 21 of chapter 3, he that overcometh, to him that overcometh, will I grant to sit with me in my throne even as I also overcame. Overcometh is present tense. Present tense. Now, Jesus is not talking about a future time. Right now. And he says, I'll make him sit with me in my throne. Sit with me in my throne. How does it say that? Will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne? Is that about a future time, or is that about now? Listen to this verse. In Ephesians 2, verse 6, it says, And he hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. When you are an overcomer, I believe you have a place in Jesus Christ that those that are being overcome don't have. I believe in that place next to Jesus, there is sweet fellowship, there's security, there's direction. And we could talk more about what happens there but not now. Overcoming speaks of struggle. Most times it takes a lot of struggle or effort or perseverance or endurance or patience to overcome something, right? I believe that overcoming is a process. Life without struggle or war is impossible. It's that way in nature, and it's that way in our spiritual life. The very fact that you have a certain amount of health mentally, physically, morally, spiritually is because of struggle or war or antagonism. It's a fact of life. Without struggle, there's no life. You know, most things outside of the body have the pull of death on our lives. There are germs all around us. And as soon as a germ enters the body, what happens? What happens? Okay. What keeps it from multiplying? Okay. What is it? Do you know what it is? White blood cells. They'll attack it. They'll just start attacking it, and they'll attack it, and they take care of those germs so there's no infection, right? And so you have a certain amount of health because of the struggle within. So it is in the spiritual life. I'd like to say this evening that either you are an overcomer or you are being overcome. There's no middle ground. You're either an overcomer or you're being overcome. Now to be overcome takes no effort at all. It takes no diligence, no backbone, no strength, weaklings qualify for this. It's the easiest thing in the world to do. It's the path of the least resistance. We're born with that natural bend to sin. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. 1 John 1.8 says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Psalm 53 verse 3 says, Every one of them has gone back. They are altogether become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. It looks like the odds are stacked against us, doesn't it? To be overcome. But when, when you add God to the picture, the odds are decreased very greatly. Why did God give us a choice? You know, God could have made us robots. Wouldn't that be nice if we would be robots? We would just have to do what, the, what God says. We could just be love him all the time because we couldn't do anything else. Wouldn't that be nice? God didn't want a robotic response. He didn't want a robotic response. He wanted a loving response. He wanted a loving response. In Romans 12, verse 1, it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. God would like to have a volunteer army. A volunteer army. 
He wants you to love him voluntarily. The Bible says in 1 John 4, 19, we love him because he first loved us. He was hoping that you would love him back in return. He loved you so much, and he was hoping that you would love him back. Volunteers are usually somewhere because they want to be there. You know, you work with a group of volunteers, it is amazing what kind of work you can get done in a short time. You work with some people that have to be there, they don't want to be there, but they have to be there, it's amazing how much work you can't get done. Not only you can't get done, but they'll try to cut the corners. Volunteers don't, 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 don't not, do not only are not there because they want to be there and they work as hard as they can, but they go over and beyond. God wants a volunteer in his army. He wants you in his army because you want to be there, not because you have to be there. What are the reasons for temptation or trials. One reason I believe is in Deuteronomy 13, verse 3. It says, Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. I believe, number, the Lord, number one, that the Lord wants you to know, wants you to know whether you love him or no. He wants to see if anything has taken his place in your life. That's why he sends you temptation. He wants to see if, if, if he's number one. And he gives you opportunity to show this. So the Lord tries to see if anything else, if anything has taken his place. Number two, I believe the Lord sends us trials to beautify us. The Bible says... In James 1, verse 2, it says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations. Do you like temptations? The Bible says you should get excited when you get all kinds of temptations. Do you know why? It works all kinds of good things into your life. When you overcome temptation, it works things into your life that would never be there if it wouldn't happen. Things like patience. Perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, meekness, temperance, humility, wisdom. God would like to beautify your life through temptation and through trials. Job 23 verse 10 says, But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Here's a quote. The hotter the fire the more pure the gold, the brighter it glows, and the more valuable it is. The hotter the fire, the more pure the gold, the brighter it glows, and the more valuable it is. Number three, another reason I believe the Lord sends us trials and testings is found in Deuteronomy 8. Turn there with me, please. Deuteronomy chapter 8. I'd like to read one, verse 1 and 2. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 1 and 2. All the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do that ye may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. I believe the third way, the third reason God sends temptation and trial to us is to see what, was, what is in our heart. Now, does God need to know what's in your heart? Does God need to know what's in your heart? No. He already knows what's in your heart. Who needs to know what's in your heart? You do. The 
the Bible says that the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And part of the, the reason for temptation, I believe, is to show us what is in our heart. I wonder, how have you been doing? The temptations that you faced recently, did you overcome or were you overcome? It shows us what's in our heart. So temptation is valuable to us in that it shows us if anything has taken the place of God. It beautifies us, and it shows us what is in our heart. And there's one more. I believe that temptation and trials come for this reason, because without resistance or opposition, there's no fulfillment or satisfaction. The world, we all want satisfaction, right? We all want fulfillment and satisfaction in life. But the world runs after the things that they want, that are easy, the, the path of the least resistance. There is no pleasure in following the path of the re least resistance. It's when you face opposition and you are victorious that you find fulfillment. You know, you all play ball here sometimes. You, you boys especially, you like hitting home runs probably. That, that, that's a lot of fun, right? Well, suppose we'd go out here and we play a game of ball. But this time, we would do it differently. We're just going to have one team. And we're in. We're, we're batting. All right? And we would bat. And we could go around the batting, batting uh, lineup and we'd hit home runs. We could make points. We could make points. I mean, wouldn't that be, a, wouldn't that be a so much fun? You could run around the bases, and you could, you could make 100 points in one inning. Wouldn't that be great? You'd say, how boring. But when there's opposition, and you hit a home run, oh, that's really, that's satisfying, isn't it? That's pretty fleshly. But just to help us see the picture. When there's opposition and there's, it's a close game and you win, oh, the victory is sweet. The same way in our spiritual lives. When there's opposition and there's temptation and there's trial and we get the victory, the victory is sweet. There cannot be any fulfillment or satisfaction without victory. And there's no victory without opposition. So why is it that so often we are overcome? I brought a little cup. Here's a cup of water. And here's some, what does that look like? It's not diesel fuel. It's gas. Anyone want to drink? If I would have you come up here for a drink, which one would you drink? Water or gas? I'm reminded of a little story. A man, you know, you know how, I don't know if you have cats around here. You know how cats are. Sometimes if you have a lot of them and if they're hungry, you step outside the door and they come running, you know, just flying. Well, this man had a cat. That was uh, that did that. So he stepped out one day, and he poured into the plate some gas. And that thing started drinking the gas. All of a sudden, it took off running. It ran around the house, around the house. It got halfway around the house, and fell over. Ran out of gas. That's a, probably a story. So if I was to ask you, which one would you drink? You want to drink? This one or this one? Water. Why? This is liquid? <laughs> okay. 
I mean, what, what's wrong with this? I mean, it has maybe a little contamination in it, but why not? Why not? It would kill you. Did you know that sin will do the same thing? But because we don't see the effect immediately, we think we can get away with it. If you knew that the next time you lied, you would fall over in 10 minutes, would you lie? You'd say, no way. If you knew the next time that you saw something you shouldn't see, you're going to die in five minutes, would you look at it? you say, no, I'd be very careful. But because we don't face the effects immediately, we think somehow we can get by with sin. And it won't kill us. But the Bible says the wages of sin is death. Death. Romans 6, 23. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Sin will kill you. So what does it take to overcome? What does it take to overcome? One word. If you want to overcome something or somebody, what do you need? Okay, that's good. It's not the word I wanted. That's good also. You need Jesus. Yeah, that's for sure. That's for sure. Those are all good. The word I wanted was power. Power. We need power. In order to overcome anything, you need power and more power than the thing that's coming at you. We cannot develop this power on our own. We need someone to give us this power. In Matthew 28, verse 19, it says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. If you are not a Christian tonight, you are powerless. Because the Bible says that Christ has all power. If you don't have him in your heart, you cannot expect to be an overcomer. 1 John 1.12 says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. I guess that's sturdy enough. That won't fall off there. The Lord Jesus gives us power to become sons. Power to change the things that are not according to the scripture. And power to do the things the scripture says we should do. Acts 1.8 says, But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in all Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13 says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. If you experience temptation, the Bible says that's common. You're common. That's human. Furthermore, it says that God has his eye on you. He's got your back. He will not let anything into you that you can't handle. Isn't that amazing? God personally screens the temptations for you and I. And he said he won't give us anything that we can't handle. What a tremendous God. To care about us that way. I'd like to look at three words that help us overcome temptation. Three, three, three things that help us overcome temptation. Most temptations in our lives come from three places. The world, the flesh, and the devil. The world, the flesh, and the devil. And I would like to look at three words to remember to counteract each of these areas of temptation. Three words that will counteract the temptations that come from the world, from the flesh, and from the devil. The first one. The first one is faith. Faith is the key word to ward off temptations from the world. 
1 John 5, verse 4 says, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Faith is the key word in overcoming temptations from the world. What is the world? How, how do you know if a person is worldly? Isn't it anything that keeps me from loving God or takes the love of God from me, that keeps me from having communion with God, that keeps me from serving him faithfully? That is worldly. It's not just dress. It's not just, it's anything that separates me from God, that keeps me from the love of God. That's worldly. Some of the temptations that come from the world are fame, recognition. We like recognition. Riches, outer beauty. Probably that goes more for this side than this side. From one thrill to the next. We all want satisfaction. But worldly people are looking for satisfaction in the wrong places. The wrong things. They think that fame, being a star could give them some satisfaction. Oh, if only they could have that nice car or have a huge house or a pretty woman or go on all kinds of trips. Some spend most of their money on being up to date with clothes and cosmetics because after all, outward beauty is the thing that matters. Is that what brings us acceptance and satisfaction? I believe there are some celebrities that have all these things that are some of the most unfulfilled, unsatisfied people in the world. Faith is believing what the word of God says. Faith is the thing that overcomes this temptation. The world says, if you have fame and popularity, everyone will serve you. And that's what brings satisfaction. You know what the Bible says brings satisfaction? The Bible says, if you want to be great in my kingdom, you need to be a servant of all. This is true satisfaction. And faith helps me believe what God says about fame and helps me live it out. That's how faith overcomes the world. Faith that what God says about riches will truly bring me satisfaction and will guard against the temptations that the world would like to bring me in this area. Money equals power. The American dream. Be able to live like you want. Is that God's standard? This is God's standard. 1 Timothy 6, verse 6 says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. If you are godly and content, the Bible says you are a rich person. You're a rich person. Faith is believing. What the Lord says about outward beauty is really how it is. And not what the world says outward beauty does. The world says, in order to be attractive, you need physical beauty. You know what the Bible says? In Proverbs 31, verse 30, it says, Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. That is true satisfaction, ladies. A woman that fears the Lord is way above beauty. In 1 Peter 3, 1 through 5, it says the beauty, it talks about the beauty of a meek and quiet spirit. Faith makes this real to me. Faith in believing what God says about my beauty is true, and that's what I'll work on. Faith is believing the Son of God, and that he has all things and knows all things, the best things, the only things that will make me truly satisfied. 1 John 2, verse 15 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. This verse seems to indicate that if we love the world, it's because the love of the Father is not in us. In other words, the love of the world is a symptom that the love of the Father is not in us. If you were driving your truck or your car down the road and 
all of a sudden there's a little red light comes on and it says oil. I'll tell you what you need to do. You need to carry a little hammer in your car. And when that light comes on, you just take that hammer and go, boom. And you can go on your way rejoicing. Right? You fix the problem. Right? No. No. If you don't stop and take care of it, you're going to have a disaster. You're going to have a disaster. So it is in our journey of life. When you find yourself loving the world, it's the red light on your dashboard. And I think it would read faith. Faith. And if you don't overhaul it, you're going to end up in disaster. You need a faith overhaul. How do you get a faith overhaul? The Bible says, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. This is having a faith overhaul, right? Expose yourself to the word of God. The more you can get into the word of God, the better for a faith overhaul. So faith is the key word for overcoming the world. The second word, against the flesh, the key word is flight. F-L-I-G-H-T, flight. 2 Timothy 2.22 says, Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. It tells us to get up and flee youthful lusts. He's not talking about only youth. All of us. But not only does he tell us to flee, but what to do when we flee. He gives us a remedy for lust. Follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 18 says, Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. When it comes to sins of the flesh, we are supposed to be first class cowards. We're supposed to run. Get away. Get out. Our flesh is powerful enough that we cannot dabble with it and think we are strong enough to resist when we need to. We will fall. And then it's often so hard to let go. And besides, there are usually lifelong regrets. Consider Joseph. What if Joseph would have said, Now, Miss Potiphar, before we do this terrible thing, let's, let's consider the, 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 the results of this. In our lives. Or if he would have said, let's get down and pray about this before. No, he didn't do that. He got out. But you know, sometimes we do that. We know we're in a bad situation. We pray, but we stay. We need to run to get out. Genesis 39 verse 10, it says, And it came to pass, as she spake to Joseph day by day, that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. Sometimes the way to escape is the king's highway, two legs and a hard run. So the key word for sins of the flesh is flight. And lastly, the key word against the devil, the temptations of the spirit is fight. Fight. You're not to flee from the devil. He's to flee from you. Now, are you that scary that you can make the devil run away from you? I say there's no way. There's only one that the devil is scared of, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. James 2, verse 19 says, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Oh, I believe in the presence of God. They tremble because they know they're doomed. And it will be God that will send them to that eternal doom. That's why I believe it is so important to heed the word of God when fighting the devil. James 4, verse 7 says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now, I would like to suggest to you that the resisting is not the important thing in this verse. It says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. If you don't submit to God first, there will be no resisting. It takes a submission to God first, and then you can resist it. And he will flee from you.
That, I believe, is why it's important to submit to God or his word and fight the devil in that premise through his word. After all, did not Jesus, when confronted with the devil, he used the word of God one, two, three times. He quoted scripture to the devil when he was directly tempted by him. He used scripture. 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil... As a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resists steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. You know, sometimes we try to argue with the devil. Have you ever done that? Don't argue with the devil. You will not out-argue the devil. Resist the devil with the word of God. So in conclusion, overcome the world with faith. Overcome the flesh by flight. And resist the devil with a fight. By the word of God. God bless you. Turn the time back over.